This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode of Superior Sports Talk presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. What's happening, Reggie? Tuesday. Man. Happy Tuesday, man. Happy Tuesday. Uh, I told Belle, our meteorologist, that she's turning up the heat outside. I don't know about that. I don't hey. know about it. Hey, I'm going tropical today, man. Triple digits <laughs> on the way. Nearly 100 degrees in the Twin mm. Cities. Speaking of heat, Byron Buxton, is he the hottest player in the MLB right now? That'll be. And That'll be. Which team in the NFC North has built the best offensive line? Plus later, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean? It's all coming up on Superior Sports Talk. But first, save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family-served business serving do-it-yourselfers like Reggie and I for over 20 years. Reliably low prices for every customer, from brake parts to tail lamps, even new carpet for your vehicle. Go to rockauto.com and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in their how did you hear about us section so they know we sent you. That's rockauto.com. All right, we're exactly two months away from the Vikings' first football game when they take on the Las Vegas Raiders. First week of preseason, August 14th. This week, PFF released the rankings of all 32 NFL teams, specifically their offensive line rankings. And all of a sudden, watch out. The Detroit Lions have the third best offensive line in the league, according to the website Packers right behind them with the fifth ranked blocking unit. The Vikings cracked the top 20 at least, landing at 19. And the Bears, well, they tried. Second and mm. dead last at 31. Not what you want to see or hear when you're trying to develop Justin Fields, but we won't talk about that. Okay, so <laughs> Vikings land in Tier 4 of PFF's rankings under the at least one good tackle, referring to Brian O'Neill, who's been right. the rock and foundation of the unit. Reggie, the Vikes are in the lower half of the list, and I know you haven't followed this team closely the past decade, but ever since Brett Favre, that era ended, they've been in search and need of a complete O-line, struggling to put together a top 10 unit over the past 10 years. It seems like... They've always had one or two really solid blockers, but the rest has been just kind of a Ferris wheel of guys jumping in, trying their luck, and getting tossed to the curb. Every year, heading into camp, there's always an interior line battle up for grabs. Not much consistency or continuity up and down the unit, top to bottom. They take a lot of flyers on day three, late round picks, hoping they can develop them into another John Sullivan. But now, you look at what Rick Spielman did his final years when he finally invested early capital, premium picks into the unit. And it's like the saying goes, I mean, you get what you pay for. Second rounders with O'Neal and Ezra. For Cleveland, first rounders with Christian Derisaw, Garrett Bradbury, third rounder on Wyatt Davis. How good can this O line be in 2022? They still got to go out and prove it, but what's the ceiling for the Vikes offensive line in your opinion? You know what's interesting about this article is they have the Vikings at 19, mm -hmm. and then they start with this could sneakily be the best offensive line of quarterback Kirk Cousins' Vikings career. And it's just like, the best O line of his career, and they're at nineteen. Goodness, what's that say? Oof. Goodness, you know what's interesting too is one of their opponents of this next season, the Buffalo Bills. They're right behind them at twenty. Interesting. And many people, yeah, many people have the Bills being one of the best teams in football. Like a lot of people are predicting that the Bills, you know, that Rams-Bills matchup in week one mm -hmm. being like a, a pseudo preview of the Super Bowl next year. And they got the Bills at the 20th ranked offensive line. So it's just like, well, you know, hey, maybe maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good sign, you know. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, you see teams like the Packers who have traditionally had a good offensive line because they've had good quarterbacks and you got to keep those guys clean for like the past, what, two decades, it seems they've had great quarterbacks at the uh, Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you got to keep a, a consistently good offensive line for them. But also, 
you know, look at what the Lions have done. Three first round picks along that that offensive line. And, you know, if they're lower than three, then that's probably a problem. Mm. But they got some dudes, you know, mm-hmm. like they draft Panay Sewell. You know, a lot of people were were thinking that maybe the Bengals would take him, you know, because, you know, Joe Burrow spent a lot of his rookie year on his backside. He spent a lot of last year on his backside, mm-hmm. too. But they still got to the Super Bowl. But, you know, he was, like, kind of projected as a can't-miss prospect. Uh, Brad Holmes, when they drafted him, like, acted like he had just won the Super Bowl in that green room, in the war room. And that was interesting to see. But, you know, I think as far as the Vikings go, you know, it's funny. We keep looking at these projections, and every projection has Ed Ingram just penciled in at that right guard spot. Like, a lot of people just believe that he is the guy to plug in. And we talked about Wyatt Davis last uh, yesterday on the show. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, he could challenge for that spot. You know, he could also challenge for that left guard spot with Ezra uh, Cleveland there. And so... I, I don't know. I, I think I think the, the line should be much improved. You know, you got some guys on the line with something to prove, like Garrett, Garrett Bradbury, who is, you know, kind of playing for a contract. He's like, okay, yeah, y'all aren't going to tender me, you know, fifth-year option. Okay. All right, watch this. Mm-hmm. Going to be the best center play that you've ever seen centered. And then, you know, Darisaw expected to take a, a, a leap forward, you know, last year. He talked a lot about, you know, hey, nobody's touching Kirk. Nobody's going to touch him. And, you know, they played the the musical chairs with him and Rashad Hill for uh, a big part of the season last year. And now this is his job. And now we're going to see what he can do with a full off season. got some experience under his belt. And you hope to see, as a Vikings fan, him take that next step forward. And if he does... You got two bookends on the right and left side, and Kirk Cousins is going to feel really good dropping back, trying to, you know, find his guys all throughout the field, knowing that he's going to be protected on the outside. But then now you got to look at the inside with the guard play and the center play. Hopefully things aren't, like, eroding, Mm. you know, on the inside for him as he's trying to get these passes off. And I do want to touch on the Lions, maybe even the Packers here in a second. But first, back to the Vikes again. Get what you pay for. The Vikings' old regime Mm -hmm. constantly tried to get cued and hit on the next John Sullivan, who they found in the sixth round from Notre Dame. Turned out to be a really solid center for years until a lower back injury wiped Mm -hmm. him out. Sixth rounder on Brandon Fusco from Slipper. Fourth rounder on TJ Clemens. A lot of Vikings fans remember him. A lot of high hope, high expectations. Never panned out. Third rounder on Pat Elfline from Ohio State. Never panned out. Danny Isadora, fifth rounder out of Miami in 2017. Those guys were expected to come in and compete for a starting job when it's like they just simply don't have the talent to be a starter at that level. Then they would patch up the rest with free agency. Riley Reef was solid. Mike mm-hmm. Remmers, Joe Berger, Charlie Johnson, Jeremiah Searle started for a little bit. They finally learned their lesson, though, and used early picks, and it just feels like The potential of this young unit is the highest it's been in a long time. And that's important because when you got somebody like Kirk Cousins, as you mentioned, who lives and dies in the pocket, not a guy who's going to create plays with his feet, make things happen outside the pocket. He needs a clean pocket to step up into. You better have the right guys and the right talent to get the job done. And that's why I think fans should be excited no matter who wins that right guard battle. Five guys with early round talent will be blocking in front of Cousins for the first time in over a decade. So a lot to be excited about there. How about the rest of the NFC North? You mentioned the Lions. Mm -hmm. They've done something similar going out and using not just early draft picks, but top 20, top 10 picks on their own line. Frank Ragnow, top 20 picks, stud center, one of the best in the league. Panay Sewell, Taylor Decker, both top 10 guys. Those are like blue chip cornerstones to build around for a long time. Whether it's the Lions ranking third on PFF's list or the Packers or the Bears, what else sticks out to you on this list outside the Vikings in the NFC North? You know, what's interesting is the Eagles they have at number one. Yeah, wow. The Eagles. And, you know, it's pretty cool, though, that they do boast something like that because they do have – 
you know, this quarterback who is needing some time back there, going to be mobile, you know, making some things happen. So, you know, those guys kind of have to hold their blocks a little bit longer than maybe a traditional drop back quarterback. And I think that's going to be very interesting because the Vikings are going to see this Eagles team in week two. And we've been talking so much about the Vikings defensive line and how they're going to be getting after it in this new front. And that's going to be a test for them coming up in week two, like to see Zadarius and Daniil going up against guys like Lane Johnson. You know, Jason Kelsey's been just a rock back there for years and years and I think that's going to be a really great chess match to see who who gets the better of who but they're going to be rearing back coming after Jalen Hurts and that's going to be a fun matchup in in week two and you think about the Eagles too they had two first round picks and they didn't use either of them on an offensive lineman a lot of people thought they would to try to replace Jason Kels at minimum but Uh, they still rank number one on PFF's offensive line rankings. I have a hard time with the Packers at five because of exactly what we just talked about. You get what you pay for, but Mm -hmm. the Packers are five on the list without using premium capital. Not one single first-round pick on their O-line. couple late seconds in Elton Jenkins and Josh Myers, but when you strike gold with a guy like David Bakhtiari in the fourth round, makes life a lot easier. Makes you wonder how much having an elite superstar our quarterback like Aaron Rodgers has on the effectiveness and the output of the blocking up front. I mean, when you have a guy that can not only get rid of the ball so quickly, but with deadly accuracy, it just makes the job up front night and day easier. Mm -hmm. If there was one O-lineman you could steal from another NFC North team, swap them out with the current starter, who you taking? Ooh, Ooh, this is good, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Ooh, okay, so immediately you, you kind of think about, like, rag now mm-hmm. um, because, you know, they're, they're not all that sold on their current center. This is tough because I believe in Christian Derrissaw, so it's like I don't necessarily want to take a tackle away from a team. Right, exactly. Just because you're like, you believe in O'Neal, and I believe that Derrissaw is going to be, you know, a burgeoning mm-hmm. young player in the league. Maybe for that left guard position, maybe mm-hmm. maybe you'll, you'll snatch John Runyon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good about, one right there. Yeah, how about yeah, that? that? You know, Penny Sewell would be maybe the easy choice. Maybe Taylor Decker, both mm-hmm. young and play. Again, the far premium tackle positions. But again, as you mentioned, we got Brian O'Neill and Christian Derrissaw. Do I really want to double dip there? I, I think the wild card for me would be actually Frank Ragnall because yep. I know it's a center position, maybe not quite as valuable as a tackle, but multiple Pro Bowl selections. And you'd be turning your biggest weakness, arguably, into maybe your biggest strength. So rock solid as they come in both the run and the pass protection. We talked about giving Cousins a clean pocket to step into. I think help maximize Cousins' talents as a pure pocket passer. When he's protected well and can step up into that pocket, Cousins can be deadly accurate in his own right. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, that's a tough one. But yeah, Frank Ragnall, I think, kind of the sneaky wild card for me. All right, just five weeks before the start of training camp takes place at TCO Facilities. Guys resting up right now, enjoying the last little free time they have before clocking into work for the 2022 season right around the corner okay coming up we're talking if byron buxton is the hottest player in the mlb right now and later i'm putting reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean but first our partners at bet online continue to be your number one source for all your betting needs find all the latest odds news and sports info including this year's basketball finals major league baseball fights and even nfl futures head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions bet online It's where the game starts. Let's talk about those Twins, shall we? Quick recap from last night. Twins win 3-2 out on the West Coast, late start. Mm -hmm. Buxton starts the game off with a two-run bomb, his 18th of the year and fourth in five games. He's actually now gone 15 of 32 with six home runs in his last 
eight games versus the Mariners. Max Kepler adds an insurance run late. Buxton scores on that one. Chris Archer doing Chris Archer things. Four innings, just 67 pitches. Allows just one run earned. Four hits, three Ks. It was all up to the relievers from that point on. Twins used a mix of six different arms, including Johan Duran in the eighth. He rings up two more Ks. Twins play some small ball, win the first of three. We'll preview the rest of the series, take a look at the AL Central. But Reggie, just your quick thoughts on last night's performance. Not the 12 to 8 kind of slugfest we've been getting used to seeing. You know, what's interesting is, you know, Rocco seems to be very determined not to pitch Chris Archer very long. Yes, he does. I think he's trying to preserve him. Mm -hmm. And that's cool and all. But then you put the the ball in the bullpen, and I think that probably gives fans ulcers because you're just like, oh, my God, here we go. <sighs> it's just like one of those things where you're just like, all right, where's the pep toe? Because, <laughs> like, you've seen it time and time again. And so I think the cool thing about last night was that the bullpen held the lead, you know, like, they decided to to do their thing because it's a toss-up with this bullpen. You never know what you're going to get. Like, even, you know, we've had we, – we've seen Yohan Duran come in and get tagged. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, this dude is human. Like, anybody can get it on that bullpen. And you, you get scared whenever you start talking about Tyler Duffy because you're just like, oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. No lead is safe. And so for them to hold on 3-2 yesterday, I think that was the most impressive part. And they're, just, they're so unpredictable because you're just like, okay, you think that they're going to score like six to ten runs in a game and, and try to, you know, maybe just out hit a team. And then you play a game like last night where the pitching was there like they were supposed to be and they win a close ball game 3-2. to two. They won a tight one. And you're just like, wow, like how are they doing this? What's cool is usually the mark of a good team is finding ways to win no matter what. And we've seen this team this year win shutout games. We've seen them blow teams out. We've seen them come back and beat teams. We've seen them win, you know, uh, whoever scores last wins mm -hmm. type games. And then we saw what we saw last night, them holding on to a lead. I mean, things would suggest that maybe this Twins team is good. And should I duck? Is anybody <laughs> throwing tomatoes? Come on, knock anything? on wood. Where is it? Knock it's on just, wood. Okay, right. I got some wood here. I'm yeah, knocking yeah. on. Okay. Mm -hmm. But maybe they're good, Luke. Maybe they're good. I saw an expert on CBS Sports yesterday before the game saying, smash the over, Twins Mariners, eight and a half. It's a mm -hmm. gimme. It's a lock. Two average, maybe above average pitchers, but they're due. This should be a 12 to eight kind of game. Three to two. That's what yep. you get. Tonight, it's the return of Joe Ryan, who was yeah. on the COVID list on May 25th and... Sonny Gray will round out the series on Wednesday, who returns from the IL as well. Reggie, don't look now. Twins yeah. three and a half games up in the Central, and now they get their top two pitchers back in the rotation as well. Yeah, and like I said before, Ryan looked good in mm -hmm. his rehab start, and Sonny looked good before he went down with the injury. And so what you hope is that they'll just kind of pick up where they left off. And that's a good thing, you know. You don't have your top pitchers out there with, you know, Ryan, Gray, Ober. And we talked about that yesterday. But then when you're able to put a guy out there who's been through the fire a little bit, who knows how to get himself out of trouble, which he did last night, and Chris Archer, like that almost seems like a luxury because it's like this guy's a veteran pitcher. He knows how to pitch in this league. And everybody else has been hurt but him. And it's probably because Rocco is like, okay, how many pitches is he at? <laughs> Where 60? we at here? Yeah. 60? All right, all right. <laughs> get him out of there. Get him out of there. We got to preserve him. We got to oh. preserve him. Mm. And I, I saw an article, too, just talking about how um, Archer kind of struggled with some hip-type issues. Mm. And now, you know, he's been doing Pilates, and that's really kind of helped him. And now, you know, the velocity is up. And, you know, his control is better than it's been in recent years. And he attributes a lot of that to 
doing yoga and Pilates. And so I'm like, look, hey, whatever works, whatever what? keeps you out there, you know. But what's funny is, and what the cool thing about getting some reinforcements back, Joe Ryan is coming back, Sonny Gray is coming back, and it looks like the White Sox are imploding. Mm-hmm. There was a clip going on, going around on Twitter yesterday with Lance Lynn and one of the coaches just going the freak at it. Like, just going at each other, getting into it. Lance Lynn was not happy. Heated up, yeah. You yeah, got, it. yeah, you got, you know, articles talking about Tony La Russa is getting the Matt Nagy treatment from his own fan base. They're calling for his head. And it's interesting because we see what can happen if a team gets hot. You know, we've seen it with the Phillies. This year, the Atlanta Braves, 11 straight wins, going from like a little bit of a dumpster fire to one of the hottest teams in baseball. And you're just waiting because you see the talent on this White Sox team. You're just waiting for them to finally heat up, get that grill going, and start barbecuing teams. (laughs) But with all this imploding, it seems like it's happening from the inside going out. Maybe you're just like, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe they're not going to be that good this year. And then you're just competing against the Guardians for that top spot. And like I said, the Guardians are probably the surprise team of the division. I don't know if anybody expected them to be challenging for, you know, the lead in the division. But three, three and a half games back right now, like, that's pretty good. And it would behoove of the Twins to keep winning and to keep doing their thing because they're kind of nipping at their heels a little bit. And I don't know if we expected this from them, but they have a great manager. And, you know, they have some good pieces on that team. So you're just like, all right, they're 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 doing what maybe you expect them to do when they have a little bit of the pedigree that they have. But... I think it's the Twins' division to lose at this point because they're they're doing what they need to do. Now you get reinforcements back with Ryan and with Gray. It's always sunny in Minnesota, Mm -hmm. you know? It's always sunny as long as he stays healthy. And now you're like, okay, let's do what we have to do. Maybe we don't have to win these games 10-9, to 11-8, or whatever the case may be because maybe some of this pitching is going to help us not have to do that. And the bats seem to be waking up just in time for the sun. I mean, obviously so nice to get Joe Ryan, Sonny Gray back, but Mm -hmm. how about just a moment of reflection and appreciation for what the twin starters have done filling in for those guys. Kevin Smeltzer balling out. Yeah. Chris Archer, every chance you give them, just consistent as they come. Chewing yep. up four to five innings gives the team a chance. Dylan yep. Bundy is a guy, you know. Uh, all in all, though, can't say enough about the Twins pitching, saving this team when they needed them the most while the starters and studs were out and the bats went cold, too. You just mentioned it. little preview, look ahead, AL Central. Don't look now. Guardians, not the White Sox. We're in second place behind the Twins, three and a half games back. White Sox remain six games back after a win last night, but again, just Seems like their stock, as you mentioned, starting to slowly plummet in the wrong direction. First 61 games in the book. Twins are 36-27 with reinforcements on the way. Twins have two more with Seattle, then stay on the West Coast for the Diamondbacks, then have eight. Eight games of their next 11 versus the division rival Cleveland Guardians. So things are going to get real here when that stretch comes up for sure in about a week and a half, two weeks. Joe Ryan again set to hit the mound for the first time in over three weeks tonight. Another late one, first pitch, 9-10. Rest assured, Reggie and I will be back here tomorrow to break all that action down. All right, the time has come. My favorite segment's here. I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with What Does It Mean? covering all the latest hot topics in Minnesota sports. First up, the Golden State Warriors went up three games to two over the Boston Celtics with a 104-94 win last night. What does it mean for the Celtics' chance to survive and bounce back in game six knowing what we know about the resilience and just the bounce back ability of this Celtics team? You know what's crazy is watching these last two games and the Warriors do what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, Steph go off, goes off in game four. But then 
all of a sudden, what's going on with Steph in game five? Oof. You're just like, you you don't hit a three, bucko? Like S- streak was broke last yeah, night. Yeah, like that was weird. Games? That wow. was weird. Mm-hmm. And you know what's interesting is the Warriors are just winning off pure just like pedigree, I feel like. For sure. Because I don't think anybody looks at this series and they're just like, the Warriors are clear, you know, far and away the better team. I don't think anybody looks at this series like that. Boston, I think, is the more the more talented team. But goodness gracious, if they just can't hold on to the ball, man. Mm. So many turnovers. So many just dumb plays out there. And you just want to attribute it to their youth. But, like, man, they've been around for a while now. Like, they've been – contending in the playoffs for a while and you would think that they would learn from their mistakes and now you know with all that they've been through in the playoffs this year alone they've they've kind of proven their medal but it's just like yo like you see the talent there and I think like if you're a Golden State fan you're just like oh my god oh my god can we just go ahead and just go ahead and win this thing like Let's just let's just snatch it. Like let's let's just try to get it. Don't get we don't cute. want them to put yeah, this away we, now. Yeah, put it away because we don't want Boston to really like mm-hmm. actually see who they are mm. and what they are, which is a really good team. That being said, I think going back to Boston for game six, I think Boston is gonna win. Let me put on my Charles Barkley hat. Listen, listen, listen. listen. Terrible terrible. Listen, the, the Boston Celtics had to be about the most dumbest team I've ever seen. But but listen, listen. But first of all, first of all, I think game six guaranteed the Boston Celtics, the Boston Celtics, I think, are going to win. We deserve seven games in this series. And maybe just for my own selfish desire, because after this, we don't get NBA for three, four months. So... I'm selfishly picking the Celtics to win game six. I think they're going to bounce back because they've been resilient. And also, you, you've just kind of seen the Warriors pull away, whether it's the third or the fourth. Last night, that bucket from Pool Party. Mm. Jordan Poole knocks in that third quarter buzzer beater. And that seemed to just take the momentum all the way into the fourth quarter. And the Warriors just kind of surged and, and did their thing because the Celtics had an unreal third quarter. I think it was something like they made like eight straight threes or something like that. It was yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, outscored 35-24. I mean, 11-point yeah. lead and in, then, the, in the third. Yeah. But the Warriors stuck close. Mm-hmm. They weren't able to, you know, get avalanched. And they were able to stick close. And then Poole sinks that three at the buzzer. And that just seemed to do something for them. And they just cooked them. You know, Clay. Freaking Andrew Wiggins, man! All the all the the Wolves fans are just like, man, d- d- don't do man, it, don't do it, Reggie, man. It. But you know, I think the change of scenery was good, and the the motivation that he gets from those guys around him because they need him to be great, so they keep pushing him to be great and to realize his potential. That's important, man. When he slammed home that dunk, that was kind of like the dagger. And then Clay hit the three. That was even more of a dagger. He's just like, all right, well, thanks for coming, Boston. But like I said, I think when they go back to Boston, they win. And then we come back to Golden State for game seven. And then it's whoever you got at that point. It's vibes at that point. I got a little sneaky wild card question for you here. All Andrew right. Wiggins, you mentioned him, led the team last night, 43 points, led the team with a double-double, 26 points. Steph Curry, ice cold from 3, 0 of 9, snaps his 223-game streak mm-hmm. of hitting at least one three-pointer. You think Andrew Wiggins has a chance, if the Warriors go on to win this thing, to be the MVP of the finals, not Steph Curry? Let me just, I'm going to look into the camera. Zoom in. Give us a nice zoom in shot. I'm grabbing the microphone because I want to be heard. No. (laughs) Look, look, Andrew Wiggins has been sensational. Yeah. Really in this whole playoffs, he's been phenomenal. He's been like, I don't know where they would be without him, honestly, because, you know, Jordan Poole, as great as he is, sometimes 
he takes some dumb shots, and you're just like, dude, what are you doing? And, you know, he only played 14 minutes yesterday off the bench for all that's been said about him and his productivity on that team. But sometimes he goes absent, and you're just like, man, you know, for as good as Clay is, I don't think Clay is the Clay of old. Mm. And, you know, he hit some big time shots yesterday and they needed those shots. Like they they bailed out a bad game by Steph. And, you know, Steph was like, this is a good team win. Yeah. Team. The team bailed Steph out because he did not have a good night last night. But that being said, the opportunities that Wiggins gets is because of the spacing on the floor due to guys like Steph and guys like Clay being out there. Because last night, I don't think I saw a wide open three from Steph at all. They were all contested. They made an, an extra push to be all up in Steph's grill last night. He was smothered for most of the night where he was just trying to get up there and just jack up shots and just try to will himself into a rhythm because he was getting nothing easy yesterday. But you know who was kind of getting some easy shots? I saw a few wide open shots. Andrew Wiggins didn't make any of his threes, but he had some wide open threes and he had some wide open lanes to go through because guys like Steph Curry is on the floor and they are determined not to let him beat you like more than once. And so Wiggins gets a lot of opportunities. So just by virtue of having the best player out there on the floor, Wiggins is getting these opportunities and he's making the most of them. So don't take anything away from him. But come on, man. Steph, it's Steph. He has one more good game in this series and it's his finals MVP. It has to be. 2015, remember, Warriors beat LeBron and Andrew Iguodala kind of snuck over LeBron and Steph Curry, who won the MVP that year, to win the finals MVP. Last night, Steph goes 0 for 9 from 3. Wiggins goes 0 for 6. Still led the team 26 points. Uh, Porter and Green both go 0 for 2. They shot 9 of 40. Thank goodness for Klay Thompson. He went 5 of 11 from 3. Yeah, man. 22% from 3-point land, and you still get the dub? Yikes. Man, that's tough to swallow if you're a Boston Celtic fan. Not sure what more you can ask for defending the 3-pointer from Steph Curry, Wiggins, and some others. All right, look, next one. But look, yeah, go hold ahead. on real quick, Luke. Yep. I'm looking at Steph Curry's stats in mm -hmm. these finals games. Yeah. Game 1, they lost. He scored 34. Right. Yeah. Game two, they won. He scored 29. They lost game three. He scored 31. Game five, 43. Game six, or no, I'm sorry, game four, 43. Game five, 16. So if you're going to give him a mulligan, like, you mm. get, like okay, maybe you don't expect him to, to go for 40, but if he keeps this clip up where he's going 30, 29, 31, like he's right around 30 points a game, give or take, besides the game last night. You got to give it to him. I'm sure there's some whispers. Maybe Wiggins could kind of fun to talk about, but odds on favorite has to be smash Steph Curry if the Warriors do indeed go on to win this game six. Thursday night, 8 p.m. TNT. Last one, what does it mean? ESPN's latest mock draft has the T-Wolves selecting Ohio State power forward EJ Liddell for need, but says Kansas small forward Abaji could be the pick if Tim Conley is drafting for best available. What does it mean for the Wolves draft game plan when choosing to draft the bigger pressing need versus just the best overall player available? We talk about the draft a lot. Mm-hmm. And what's the thing that we say all the time? Best available. Don't best get cute. Don't yeah. get cute. You look back in two, three years, the roster's changed up. And just take the best player available. Best player available. And look, if it's the Kansas guy, fine. But, you know, what we saw a lot from the Wolves last year is there were just times where the shooting just wasn't there. And – I think that was kind of tough to swallow, you know, especially seeing them in the playoffs where, you know, they would get out to these big leads and then they wouldn't be able to sustain them because when the chips were down, when the game slowed down, you needed somebody to go out there and get you a bucket and nobody was able to really do that consistently. What's tough is EJ Liddell, love the guy to death, 
We went to the same high school. Fun fact. Mm. I always say that whenever I talk about EJ Liddell. Two-time Illinois Mr. Basketball. So part my of my effect, school. you could say, had you not gone to that high school, maybe EJ Liddell would not be the EJ <laughs> Liddell we know today. That's how it works, Reggie. Uh, no, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. But he led my high school to back-to-back state championships, and that was something that we hadn't ever done before, which was really cool, mm. really awesome. He's a hometown, just like Jason Tatum is a hometown hero, EJ Liddell is a hometown hero. EJ Liddell is one of those players that benefited from staying in college for several years, developed his game, got some skill, and and really was one of college basketball's best players by far, no question. So I am high on him. That being said, EJ Liddell is as tweener as tweener goes. Like, he has a lot of skill, but he's one of those bigger guys that is not necessarily a big man. So it's like you don't throw him down there in the paint and see what he does. You know who I kind of compare him to is maybe like a Julius Randle. Mm. And Julius Randle was a little bit of a late bloomer, a late blossomer. And he's found a way, he's found a niche, he's found a way to to really kind of maximize his game in the NBA. EJ Liddell still has a ways to go as a shooter. And this is a shooting league. And while I want to say, you know, it'd be a luxury for them to take a guy like that, they kind of need a guy who can come in and make an impact right away, you know, help them just get a bucket. And I don't know if EJ Liddell is that type of guy, but if they feel like they have the pieces in place to where they don't have to lean on a guy like EJ Liddell, then take him, let him develop, and see what he develops into because I do think that he's going to be a talent in this league for a long time. But right now, I think he's a bit of a tweener, and you're just like, man, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know what exactly to get from him. I think, like, you know – Another comparison could be like a guy like Zion. He's not as explosive as Zion Williamson, obviously, but like you're just like man, like it, Zion is just a guy who can attack the basket and go get right. you a bucket that way. Mm-hmm. And maybe Liddell is kind of in that same class, but it's a shooter league, man. And you're just like I don't know if we have the time you know, for him to develop in the way that he needs to, to be a guy that, you know, that you need. But he is a very intriguing option for the Wolves. Yeah, T-Wolves of the 19th pick, draft coming up June 23rd, nine days away. There's a little bit more buzz and excitement around the T-Wolves in the draft this year because they brought in Tim Conley. He drafted Jared Vanderbilt out of Kentucky, so he's very familiar with what he brings to the table. Yeah. And maybe lack of shooting range, overall scoring prowess might cause Minnesota to look to upgrade the power forward position, making Liddell potentially very attractive. We'll find out, though, next weekend. Number one and number two picks, kind of up for grabs. Jabari Smith out of Auburn. Chet Holmgren out of Gonzaga. Magic on the number one pick. Oklahoma City Thunder on the number two pick. It's going to be fun to see how all that shakes out here next weekend. All right, that's a wrap. Back here tomorrow, breaking down more Twins, Vikings, and plenty more. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. He's Reggie Wilson. Follow him on Twitter at Reggie Wilson TV and on Care 11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Tune in Monday to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing out. Be blessed. Spread love today. This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota.